Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel, and very happy to uh, be here today with Al Espada, a professor in neurosciences and pediatrics and biological sciences and cell and molecular medicine. And uh, Al, welcome. It's very exciting to see how your career has evolved, but let's start with telling us uh, where you came from. What happened to you? How'd you grow up? And what's sure. interesting about your life? Yeah, well, I became interested in science as uh, an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, and particularly in genetics. And um, I wasn't sure if I was going to go to graduate school or to medical school. And then I learned that uh, there was a program where you could do combined training and get an MD and a PhD. And, uh, uh, and that you would be funded to do this uh, by the federal government. So I applied and I was offered a position at the University of Pennsylvania. So I pursued MD-PhD training there, and I was very fortunate to um, come in contact with uh, an esteemed neurogeneticist, Dr. Kurt Fishbeck, who oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, I decided to work on a rare neuromuscular disease, spinal and bulbar muscular atrophy, and back then what we were doing is trying to identify genes um, without really knowing much about um, the molecular or biochemical basis of a disease. And that was my thesis project. And I was able to identify a CAG repeat expansion in the androgen receptor gene as the cause of this disorder. And that was the very first time a repeat expansion mutation was identified in the human as the cause of a genetic disease. And let me just say for the audience, so this was big stuff. This was big stuff. I remember. Bob Laser coming to a child neurology conference at UCSF and saying, this is amazing. SBMA is, is a genetic disorder, and we know the gene, and how cool is that? And it was really a landmark. Congratulations. Yeah, no, thank you. It was um, really, it turned out to be very important because what we learned is that um, what happens is the CAG repeat is in what's called the coding region, and it encodes for the amino acid glutamine. So patients with this disease make a protein that has too many glutamines, and then the protein misfolds. And the misfolded protein causes the neurons to degenerate in this disorder. And what we learned uh, within the next few years is this uh, pattern of proteins misfolding um, to cause neurological disease is a theme that cuts across pretty much all neurodegenerative disorders, whether they're uh, rare disorders like spinal and bulbar muscular atrophy or very common disorders such as Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that realization back in the mid-1990s has led us now to pursue lines of investigation that hopefully someday will lead to therapies for these devastating disorders. Exciting. So um, if you were to put this in perspective, what, how, did, how did that early finding motivate you and how does it How's it built your career? How did you evolve from that early finding with the CAG repeat to where you are now? Yeah. Well, as I said, I started out as, as a geneticist. And then um, when I went to the University of Washington to do my postdoctoral training, um, I focused on trying to um, become more of a neuroscientist and also learning how to model these diseases in organisms, and I focused on using the mouse so we could try to recapitulate the diseases that occur in humans in a system where we could understand uh, the biology, the mechanistic basis, and also have uh, uh, a system where we could test therapies. Right. And so that's what I uh, focused on in the early part of my career, and I worked on a variety of polyglutamine disorders including Huntington's disease, which is probably the best known of the disorders that I started to work on as a, as a young assistant professor. And uh, we learned that there were problems with transcription regulation in these disorders, uh, that the misfolded protein would go into the nucleus and there disrupt the process by which genes uh, are um, turned into uh, the proteins that uh, you know, do the work uh, in the cell. Um, and transcription factors uh, are responsible for uh, transcribing genes into RNA and then into protein, and we realized that this process was being disrupted. But then we also learned a lot about, um, through this work, the biology of the neuron and how the neuron is different than other cell types. Mm -hmm. uh, it has very high energy demands, 
And what we learned is that it's really on the edge for um, protein quality control. And so, you know, the whole body is faced with the problem of misfolded proteins. All cells in our body face that problem. Um, but for some reason, neurons are exquisitely vulnerable to this type of cell stress. So really then I became more of a cell biologist and a biochemist you know, in the mid part of my career. And I would argue that really to work on neurological diseases, uh, you have to take what's called a systems biology approach mm -hmm. and really you know, apply a variety of different disciplines to understand what's going on at a very mechanistic level. So this way you can come up with targets for therapy development and that's what I've been trying to do now. Uh, as, as a more senior um, researcher in, in this field. And, and so <clears throat> you're taking a disease apart and one approach is to say, well, I'm going to reduce the burden of this protein in the cell. Mm -hmm. But that would be to miss all of the interesting downstream effects of this protein in a nucleus or in a cytosol or mm -hmm. in an axon. Yeah. And that's what you're up to. Yes. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, there's a process going on that um, is shared across these different diseases, but at the same time, these different diseases are different from one another. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, um, in the different diseases, misfolded proteins are expressed in all neurons and in many of them in all cells of the body. So understanding the function of the disease protein and uh, what it normally does is essential for understanding the biology of a particular di disease. So for example, in the case of Huntington's disease, we've come to appreciate that um, the mutant Huntington protein uh, forms a transcription factor and interacts with other transcription factors. And we think that uh, this uh, normal interaction becomes aberrant and we've identified um, targets uh, with uh, which it interacts and that's led us to uh, a biological understanding of Huntington's disease and a realization of how the energy production problem is particularly vexing in, mm -hmm. in this disorder. Mm -hmm. And that opens up opportunities for therapeutic intervention uh, that is more uh, tailored and hopefully more sophisticated than just a general approach. Yeah. You know, it's interesting in, in the biology of neurons, one's thinking about all these misfolded proteins and the, and, and, the, and the environment in which they operate. Uh, you've got axons, you've got dendrites, you've got cell bodies. I mean, for the neuron, this is a multifactorial problem. So how do, you, how do you think about that? How does one envision an approach to that kind of plurality uh, of issues that are essentially created by this mutant protein? Yeah. Well, you raise uh, a really interesting question, Bill, um, and, and I would say that the field still struggles um, to answer that question. <clears throat> As I said, we focus on um, what the normal function of the disease protein is in a hope that it sort of helps us to prioritize which cellular processes are most likely to be impacted. But I would argue that ultimately, you know, as disease progresses, um, you see a breakdown of all of these processes of yeah. axonal transport, um, of protein translation regulation, of protein quality control, of the health of your uh, organelles, such as the all-important mitochondria, the so-called, you know, power factory of the cell. Mm -hmm. um, but really, the goal is to sort of try and identify the proximal steps in the pathway, mm -hmm. um, so that. Uh, uh, when you come up with a therapy, it'll be more uh, directly relevant to the disease of interest. And the way we do that is we identify um, the proteins with, it, with which the disease protein interacts normally, and we have a sense of what the disease protein normally does, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where um, we focus uh, our efforts to try and uh, get a sense uh, of um, how uh, the normal functions of the protein and uh, the pathways on which it's located, how they become um, disrupted in the disease process. And the plus you have in these genetic disorders is that you can predict uh, when someone's going to have problems. So for example, in the case of Huntington disease, not to say that those patients don't have uh, any problem at all in, uh, in, in youth, but the truth is if you knew who, if, if, you, if you were aware of every person that had this mutant Huntington protein, you could act very early. You could begin to ascertain which events are going awry 
in mm -hmm. very young neurons, if you will. Yeah, so you're touching on a theme that really is critical now in neurotherapeutics. Mm -hmm. um, many people have wondered why we have not had success in, in therapies being developed for Alzheimer's disease, and some individuals feel that we're intervening too late. Um, I think that in the pharmaceutical industry, there's a growing realization that these less common or so-called rare diseases are, are a perfect venue for testing therapies because, as you point out, we can identify individuals who will go on to get Huntington's disease and uh, theoretically we could test therapies before they become uh, symptomatic. Yeah. And this is very powerful. I think the other advantage of working on a genetic disease is that um, we have a sense that all patients with Huntington's disease, that uh, the cascade of events that occur pathologically are, are, gr are pretty much shared between different patients. Whereas in more common disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, there's concern that perhaps there's six or, or seven different categories of mm -hmm. disease, that it, the disease comes in six or seven different flavors, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that uh, a therapy for Huntington's disease could be, have a better chance of success uh, in, in a patient population um, that shares uh, a similar pathobiology, I think that's important. And those therapies, we hope then, could be extended um, to more common diseases such as Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. And mm -hmm. we would see um, you know, uh, the initial uh, effectiveness achieved uh, in, in the Huntington's disease patient. Um, but because uh, we know that um, certain aspects of this neurodegenerative dis disorder uh, are shared with other more common neurodegenerative disorders, we could leverage that therapeutic advance to more common diseases. Um, yeah. That's what we're hoping. Sure. What's the most exciting thing going on in your lab right now? Right um, now? Well, we just published a paper last month in Nature Medicine uh, where we showed uh, that interference with the function of uh, a factor known as PPAR delta is a critical step in the pathogenesis of Huntington's disease. And what was particularly exciting about this work is it led us um, to a drug uh, that had been developed as a treatment for diabetes and metabolic syndrome and it actually had been in human patients and was shown to be safe in what is called phase one, the initial uh, phase of, of drug investigation. And we did what's called repurposing uh, where we applied it for a different indication, neurological disease, and in this case, Huntington's disease, and we showed it was a very effective therapy in a mouse model of Huntington's disease. And what we also did that I think was especially compelling, uh, and this work was done independently by my collaborator at, at Johns Hopkins, Christopher Ross, is we derived um, the types of neurons that degenerate in Huntington's disease from what are called um, pluripotent stem cells that are derived from skin cells from patients. And we showed that um, this drug, KD3010, is highly neuroprotective and prevents uh, Huntington's disease patient neurons from degenerating. Mm. In fact, of all the agents that Dr. Ross tested, it was uh, the most potent, only uh, comparing favorably to one of your favorite proteins, BDNF. Yeah. So. Interesting stuff. So, and, and that brings up the, the, the interesting, again, to go back to this theme, the interesting idea that if one were to have a campaign around neurodegenerative disease, you might very well be advantaged by understanding both the fundamental genetic defect, the, the, the elements of the puzzle that allow that genetic defect to work, and oh, by the way, uh, those other elements that seem to make sense. So, for example, the, the, the BDNF story, very robust, very likely to be important, but how and when and how are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, PPAR Delta it seems like it's a very close option for us. We might yeah. well work on that in the near term. Yeah, I think it's especially exciting because um, our understanding of PPAR delta neuroprotection suggests that what PPAR delta activation is doing is it's promoting um, energy production by neurons and it's mm -hmm. promoting um, what's called protein quality control. And so if you think about these neurodegenerative diseases, they occur in people who are elderly uh, or middle-aged. And one must ask the question, you know, why? 
because in the case of Huntington's disease, um, an individual is presented with the mutant protein really from when they're you know, developing as an embryo. Sure. But yet, uh, patients go four or five, sometimes six decades before they develop disease. Mm -hmm. And so what that says to me is that there are pathways in place in our neurons that are very effective at maintaining homeostasis and dealing with that stress. But what we believe is as we age, the function of those pathways decline. Mm -hmm. And so you reach a tipping point where then the disease manifestations occur. So our therapeutic uh, idea is to promote the function of those pathways, to, you know, to prop them up so that they can sort of maintain, uh, again, this equilibrium and deal with this cell stress. And my hope is that this therapeutic approach uh, would not only be effective for Huntington's disease, but could also be applied to more common disorders, especially Parkinson's disease. Yeah. So we'll have to see, and that's something that we're going to pursue. Al, you've done a terrific job. We thank you for your uh, attendance at this uh, session. We thank you for the great work you've done. We're really proud of you, and we thank you for having such great and exciting ideas that are so, in fact, uh, uh, if you will, manageable, but also uh, uh, engageable, something that we're going to learn from as time goes on so that we can deal with these degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Huntington and Parkinson's. Cool. So thanks very much for being here. Well, thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to have a chance to discuss this work with you, and uh, it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to work with you here as a colleague as well. Great. Thank you. Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel, and thanks for joining us.